Good evening and welcome back to CNN Money Switzerland and our ongoing coverage of coronavirus. I'm Olivia Chang. It's time to bring you up to speed with all the latest headlines. Over 16,000 people here in Switzerland have now tested positive for coronavirus. At least 373 people have died so far. Daniel Koch, who has been one of the main voices from the Public Health Office, also dubbed Mr. Coronavirus, is retiring on April 30th. Stefan Kuster will take over his role starting tomorrow. Meanwhile, the Swiss government has today announced the creation of a new COVID-19 task force. It's hoping to tap into the expertise of the scientific community in the country to tackle the ongoing pandemic. Some of the tasks include advising politicians and cantons, addressing innovation funding, as well as identifying crucial research areas. It's being headed by Matthias Egger, who is president of the National Research Council of the Swiss National Science Foundation. Now, coronavirus is eating into the profits of many businesses at this time, and chocolate makers are no exception. Switzerland's Linton Sprungli is scrapping its financial targets for 2020. It has come under pressure since the beginning of March, with the pandemic affecting travel retail, its network of stores, and the grocery trade. But Sprungli is still holding on to its mid to long term sales growth targets of about 5 to 7 percent. It confirmed its dividend, maintaining its start of the year off strong. The International Air Transport Association estimates that there are about $35 billion worth of unused airline tickets this quarter. The Geneva based body is hoping that more refunds in the form of vouchers can help ease the situation and, quote, preserve the cash of the airline. Staying in the air, new satellite imagery from the European Space Agency shows how the decline in traffic, air travel and overall production activities has led to a sharp drop in pollution levels. But Josef Aschbacher, director of the ESA's observation programs, says the effects are unlikely to be long lasting. My colleague Kasmir Jefford caught up with him and he starts by breaking down what the images really show. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, what do these images show? They are showing concentrations of NO2, uh, which is uh, a pollutant. Uh, it is produced mostly from uh, by cars and uh, and industry. So really comes from uh, from combustion or burning uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, in in various modes. So it really is a uh, pollution caused by by people uh, due to industrial activities. And you see. In this image, the, the spots that are more red or in dark or red colors, they are the, the, the areas where pollution is much higher as compared to other areas. So what you really see here is a comparison of uh, these NO2 levels uh, between uh, March 2019 and uh, March uh, this year, 2020. Uh, and you can very clearly see the effect of the coronavirus uh, restrictions, uh, uh, the lockdowns in many countries uh, that have reduced uh, these pollution levels drastically. So we can see the kind of red splodges fading. Uh, so we're seeing this drop in nitrogen dioxide levels. How big of a drop are we talking about here? Uh, these drops are actually quite significant. You see it also visually, but uh, if you go a bit deeper into the analysis, you see the levels dropping by about 40%, obviously depending on the country and then on the region. But uh, it is uh, a very significant drop uh, to 40%, in some cases even to 50%. So uh, this really is uh, significant. Uh, and uh, we can uh, see this uh, in, in many places. You see here the examples of, uh, of France, of Italy, of Spain. Uh, but obviously we have uh, made similar analysis of other areas also in the US. Uh, obviously China has been uh, uh, much ahead in terms of timing uh, and we have seen very strong reductions also in China, especially on the uh, Wuhan area where the, uh, the coronavirus outbreak happened first. So we've seen what's happened in just a few months, but what conclusions can we draw from here for the longer term? I mean, what does this mean in terms of the longer term fight against climate change? Okay, what does this mean? So first of all, uh, these NO2 concentrations, they are a pollutant, they are not a trace gas, uh, but obviously also other gases that are causing climate change like carbon dioxide, methane and others are also uh, being, or the, the, the emission of those gases is also being reduced uh, because similarly they also come from human activity. Uh, but what we do obviously observe is that there's also a top in some of the trace gases that are responsible for climate change and climate warming. However, 
uh, you have to put this really into context. Uh, you can see uh, this drop now very clearly uh, up to levels of uh, say 50% in, uh, in heavily populated areas, but it is a bit like uh, a smoker who has been smoking uh, all his life for 30 years and then stops, uh, stops smoking for say one week uh, and then keeps going to smoke again uh, after that one week. So this is a bit the impact we see it. Yes, there is a small drop in uh, pollution levels uh, and also trace uh, gases in the atmosphere, but the impact is very small, if not insignificant, compared to the 150 years since the industrial pollution, when CO2 levels, for example, have been steadily increasing from levels below 300 ppm to more than 400 ppm today. So what you're saying is this isn't going to make a huge difference in the long term. Once countries start going back to work, we've seen China, for example, go gradually get back to work. Where are we just going to see a jump in these um, nitrogen dioxide levels again? Unfortunately, yes. And we already see uh, in China, for example, the uh, NO2 levels picking up again. Uh, so this has been a, a short blip in the long history of uh, pollution by, by people. Uh, and uh, these two months or three months, whatever the result of this lockdown will be, is really nothing compared to the hundred or more than hundred years of uh, uh, polluting our planet. So unfortunately, yes, it may be nice to look outside and have a clear air uh, at, uh, these days but uh, the effect on climate change is, is really quite insignificant. So you're sounding quite bearish here. Can we, are there any lessons we can learn from this? Can we see any change of, in attitude or behavior going forward? Well, I think that's exactly the point uh, that you are making. Uh, yes, uh, we can see now that uh, uh, how strong the human influence is in creating pollution, but also reducing it on the spot if needed. So I think what it should really work at is uh, that humans, uh, people are thinking about it and look, I, I can actually do it if I want to do it. Uh, but uh, of course, this uh, needs some restrictions and some sacrifices uh, by many people. Of course, nobody wants to be locked up in the houses uh, for the next uh, decades to come. But I think what people realize is there are some impacts or some uh, issues where everyone can save a little bit uh, uh, on pollution levels. For example, teleworking has become uh, the normal way of working today. Maybe that's something that could be extended into the future and therefore traveling less, uh, less uh, cars, less uh, uh, air traffic and so on. But uh, uh, I think the, the awareness that yes, that we are responsible for the fate of our planet this, I think, has been created now or has been reawakened again. And I think this evidence is very strong. Also, the, the real impact on the pollution levels on the concentration of gases is small. But I think in terms of awareness and people thinking about it, I think, yes, there it, has, it really has an impact. A luxury hotel that offers a retreat from the pandemic for the privileged few. We're talking about Zurich's Le Bijou that's offering doctor's visits coronavirus testing and round-the-clock nurses' care. Take a listen. So you're charging around 500 Swiss francs per test. Now, one of our reporters here from our team recently got tested and paid 204. And there are other examples in the country of private clinics that are offering this service for about 250 francs. What comes yeah. with your package at double the cost? Well, um, first of all, you know, we have... Um, Apartments all over Switzerland, so the 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 the, the, the doctors that are um, performing the tests they need to travel there. They have tr the travel expenses obviously are included, and then you know like you go into there, you don't need to move out, and they do the whole the, the whole administration and everything around it. And they um, it, we work with a private clinic that um, also if you if you go there, and it's obviously um, a bit cheaper. Yeah, it's just um, it's a big topic of discussion, right? This shortage of tests and and limited testing, and you know. So my question was, in fact, how are you getting them? I mean, is it just about being able to pay for it? No, that's actually not the case because um, you need to have symptoms. There's now new guidelines by the government, uh, by the healthcare department. You need to have symptoms, and then um, if you if you have like the sort of the medical requirements to get tested, then you can get the tests anywhere, basically. And what do you think then of this discussion that the wealthy, in fact, are getting preferential treatment because they have better and easier access to these tests and probably even more immediate results? Is this fair? 
Um, I, I cannot really comment on you know if they get um, faster results or if they if they sort of get um, uh, if you pay more you get treated faster. As far as I understood, it's not the case um, for us. It's just an additional service that you don't need to leave the house, and I think um, it makes it a bit more a bit safer as well because then you don't need to line up at the hospital and you don't infect potentially other people with the virus. If you want to hear more, you can find the full interview online. But just a quick sports update for you now. The Swiss Super League is in shutdown with no football matches in swing. Our sports correspondent Matt Layton spoke with Jean-Francois Collet, the owner of Neuchâtel Zemax, to get his take. Jeff, what a time to be involved in football. Have you ever known anything like this? No, no, it's the first time for <laughs> lucky I am that we are, we are living such a difficult situation. And what physically the timeline? Because clearly you have massive outgoings and suddenly they're stopped. What happens there? Uh, you know, the problem is just to, to find a solution to survive at the moment. Now, we don't know when we will start again, if we will start again this season and what will be the financial um, consequence of this. So what actually happened when you realized that it was all going to stop? Did you immediately inform your staff? Did you put them on partial unemployment? How mechanically did that work out? Well, we put them in partial uh, employment, all the employees, that means the administration, the coaches and also the players. So it helped us to survive at the moment. We get some uh, financial support from the state here in Switzerland. And uh, we just hope that uh, we will be able to, to start again very soon. On a on a day to day basis, how are the the fans and how are your players and how are your staff reacting to this uh, forced uh, close down? You know, for for the the supporters, it's clear that the fans they they understand the situation. You know, they have more, much more problem with the, with themselves at the moment. They don't have to to worry so much about the club. For the player, it's difficult because you know they they try to to keep fit at home to train uh, alone. And they don't know when they will start again, and especially if they will start again. For, for their motivation, it's very difficult. And for us, for the administration, we try to, to work on the future, to be able to, to survive when the, we will start again for, with the sponsors um, for, for, ne for the next season and maybe for this season already. What sort of communication do you have with the, the Swiss football authorities and the European authorities? Are, are they giving you regular information or do you just hear it through the media? No, you know, I'm, I'm the vice president of the Swiss Football League, so uh, <laughs> I'm directly involved in, in those discussions. So uh, on my side, I, I know very much what is happening, but also the other club, we are really in, in contact with them nearly every day. And uh, with the UFA, there is discussion not only with Switzerland, it's a discussion with all European um, organizations to try to, to find a way to, to continue this championship if possible. And obviously in Switzerland, uh, media rights is not so such a massive deal as it is in the, the I suppose, the top leagues. Um, but how do you feel the season? Is there going to be an end in Switzerland? Or do you think it's better just to start again next uh, in August? Uh, it's my personal point of view. It's not the point of view of the Swiss Football League. But I think it will be very difficult to finish this season. So um, we will see. I mean, we, we just need to wait a little bit. Anyway, Switzerland cannot decide alone. So, you know, we are one country in Europe and we have to follow the rules of the UFA. So I think it's right to wait to see what the UFA will decide for all the championship. We don't want to, to go alone on one direction. I think it would be wrong. But on my side, uh, I'm also organizing tennis events and so on with ATP and WTA. And I see that it's very difficult to, to organize even in July, August. So I think it's very difficult to finish the championship this year. That's all for now. Remember, you can get involved with all of our content over at cnnmoney.ch, as well as following all of our social platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, as well as YouTube. Remember, we'll be keeping you up to date with our live stream over at our website. In the meantime, Take care and we will see you tomorrow.